Hello everybody and welcome back to my continuation of my book reading of Stephen King's Cell. The other day I finished my book reading of Stephen King's Elevation. If you haven't checked it out already, I really recommend you to go check it out. Even if you would like to read it yourself, it's a very good book. Uh, I really enjoyed that one. And today I'm going to continue with my um, Cell book reading. It's been taking me a very long time to get through this book and yeah, it's... Still gonna take me a long time to get through it, but anyway, I'm here, and um, yeah, I'm gonna continue a little bit with that as well. We got a couple more chapters to go, and uh, yeah. Anyway, without further ado, here we go. When she woke, when he woke her, she looked at him groggily, and clasps it to the breast of her sweatshirt, as if, as if afraid, he would try to take it away. He asked if she could watch from the end of the hallway for a while without falling asleep again or being seen. She said she could. Clay took her at her word and carried a chair for her. She paused for a moment at the door to the living room. Check it out, she said. He looked in over her shoulder and saw the cat, Rafe, was sleeping on Tom's belly. He grunted in amusement. She said where he put the chair far enough inside the door so someone who glanced at the house wouldn't see her. After a single look, she said, You're not a flock anymore. What happened? I don't know. <clears throat> what time is it? He glanced at his watch. 20 past 12. What time did we notice they were flocking? I don't know, Alice. He was trying to be patient with her, but he could hardly keep his eyes open. 6.30? 7? I don't know. Does it matter? If we could chart them, it might matter a lot. Don't you think? He told her that he'd think about that when he'd had some sleep. A couple of hours. Then wake me, or Tom. He said, sooner if something goes wrong. It couldn't go much wrong wronger, she said softly. Go on upstairs. You look really wasted. He went upstairs to the guest bedroom, slipped off his shoes and lay down. He thought for a moment about what she said. If we could chart him. She might have something there. Odds against, but maybe. It was a pleasant room, very pleasant, full of sun. You lay in a room like this, and it's easy. it was easy to forget there was a radio in the closet you didn't dare to turn on. Not too easy to forget your wife, estranged, but still loved. Might be dead. And your son. Not just loved, but adored. Might be crazy. Still, the body had its imperatives, didn't it? And if there had ever been a room for an afternoon nap, this was the one. The panic rat twitched but didn't bite, and Clay was asleep as soon, almost as soon as he closed his eyes. This time Alice was the one who shook him awake. The little purple sneaker swung back and forth as she did it. She had tied it around her left wrist, turning it into a rather creepy talisman. The light in the room had changed. It was going the other way, and diminished. He had turned on his side and had to urinate, a reliable sign that he had slept for some time. He sat up in a hurry and was surprised, almost appalled, to see if it was a quarter of six. He had slept for over five hours, but of course, last night he hadn't been, it hadn't been his first night of broken rest. He slept poorly the night before as well, nurse, on account of his presentation to the dark horse comics people. Is everything alright? He asked, taking her by the wrist. Why'd you let me sleep so long? Because you needed it, she said. Tom slept until 2 and I slept until 4. We've been watching together since then. Come down and look, it's pretty amazing. Are they flocking again? She nodded. We're going the other way this time. And that's not all. Come and see. He emptied his bladder and hurried downstairs. Tom and Alice were standing in the doorway to the porch with their arms around each other's waist. Each other's waist. There was no question of being seen. Now the sky had clouded over and Tom's porch was already thick with shadows. Only a few people were left on Salem Street. Anyway, all of them were moving west. Not quite running, but going at a steady clip. A group of four went past in the street itself, marching over a sprawl of bodies and the leader of discarded food, which included the leg of, of lamb 
now gnawed down to the bone, agreed many torn open cellophane bags and cardboard boxes, and a scattering of discarded fruits and vegetables. Behind him came a group of six, the one on the end, using the sidewalks. They didn't look at each other, but were still so perfectly together that when they passed Tom's house, they seemed for an instant to be only a single man, and Clay realized even their arms were swinging in unison. After them, after them came a young of maybe 14 limping along, bawling, in article, in article, in, wow, I can't even pronounce that word, in articulate, I have never heard that word before, or seen that word, cow sounds, and trying to keep up. They left the dead and totally unconscious ones, Tom said. But they actually helped a couple who were stirring, 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 yeah. Clay looked for a pregnant woman and didn't see her. Mrs. Cotoni? She was one of the ones they helped, Tom said. So they're acting like people again? Don't get that idea, Alice said. One of the men they tried to help couldn't walk, and after he fell down a couple of times, one of the guys who'd been lifting him got tired of being a boy scout and just killed him, Tom said. Not with his hands either, like the guy in the garden, with his teeth tore out his throat. I saw what was going on, what was going to happen, and looked away, Alice said, but I heard it. He squealed. Easy, Clay said. He squeezed his arms gently. Take it easy. Now the street was almost entirely empty. Two more stranglers came along. And although they moved more or less side by side, both were limping so badly there was no sense of unison about them. Where are they going? Clay asked. Alice thinks maybe inside, Tom said, and he sounded excited. Before it gets dark. She could be right. Where? Where are they going in? Have you seen any of them going into house along this block? No. They said it together. They didn't all come back, Alice said. No way did as many come back as Salem Street as went down this morning. So a lot are still in Molden Center or beyond. They may have gravi gravitated towards public buildings like school gymnasiums. School gymnasiums. Clay didn't like the sound of that. Did you see that movie Dawn of the Dead? She asked. Yes, Clay said. You're not going to tell me someone let you in to see it, are you? She looked at him as if he were nuts or old. One of my friends had a DVD. We watched it at a sleepover back in 8th grade. Back when the Pony Express still rode and the planes were dark with buffalo, her tone said. That movie... All the dead people, well, not all, but a lot, went back to the mall when they woke up. Tom McCourt goggled at her for a second, then burst out laughing. It wasn't a little laugh either, but a long series of guff, guff, guffos? I can't, that, that word I also haven't seen before. Guffos? Laughter so hard that he had to learn, had to lean against the wall for support, and Clay thought it was it's wise to shut the door between the hall and the porch. There was no telling how well the things strangled up the street might hear. All he could think of at the moment was that the hearing of the lunatic narrator in Pose, the telltale hearts, had been extremely keen. Well, they did, Alice said, putting her hands on her hips. The baby sneaker flopped. Straight to the mall, Tom laughed even harder. His knees buckled and he oozed slowly down to the hall floor, howling and flapping his hands against his shirt. They died! He gasps and came back. To go to the mall. Jesus Christ. Does Jerry F. Falwell? He went off into another keel. Tears were now running down his cheeks in clear streams. He brought himself under control enough to finish. Just does Jerry Falwell know heavens the new castle mall? <clears throat> Clay also began to laugh. So did Alice. Although Clay thought it was a little bit pissed off that her Reference had been greeted not with interest of even mild good humor, but outright howls. Still, when people started laughing, it was hard not to join in, even when you are pissed. That almost stopped when Clay said, A propos of nothing. If heaven ain't a lot like Dixie, I don't want to go. They set them off again. All three, Alice was still laughing when she said, If they're flocking, then, then roosting for the night in gyms and churches and malls, people could... Machine gunned them by the hundreds. 
Clay stopped laughing first, then Tom stopped. He looked at her, wiping moisture, moisture out of his neat little mustache. Alice nodded. The laughter had brought high color to her cheeks, and she was still smiling. She had, at least for the moment, careened past pretty and into genuine beauty by the thousands. Maybe if they're all going to the same place. Jesus, Tom said. He took off his glasses and began to, to wipe them, too. You don't fool around. It's survival, Alice said matter-of-factly. She looked down at the sneaker tied to her wrist, then up at the man. She nodded again. We ought to chart them, find out if they're flocking, and when they're flocking, if they're roosting, and where they're roosting, because if they can be charted, Clay had let them out of Boston, but when the three of them left the house on Salem Street some 24 hours later, 15-year-old Alice Maxwell was unquestionable in charge. The more Clay thought about it, the less it surprised him. Tom McCord didn't lack for what his British cousins called bottle, but he was not and never would be a natural leader. Clay had some leadership qualities, but that evening Alice had an advantage beyond her intelligence and desire to survive. She had survived her losses and began to move on, and leaving the house in Salem Street, both men were dealing with new ones. Clay had begun to suffer a rather frightening depression that at first he thought was just the result of his decision, unavoidably, really, to leave his portfolio behind as the night went on. However, he realized it was a profound dread of what he might find if and when he got to Kent Pond. For Tom, it was simpler. He hated to leave Rafe. Prop the door open for him, Alice said. The new and harder Alice, who seemed more de decisive by the minute. He'll almost certainly be okay, Tom. He'll find plenty of forage. It'll be a long time before the cats starve or the phone crazies work their way down the food chain to cat meat. He'll go feral, Tom said. He was sitting on the living room couch, looking stylish and miserable in a belted belted raincoat and tri trilby hat. Rafe was on his lap, purring and looking bored. Yeah, that's what they do, Clay said. Think of all the dogs, the little ones and the oversized ones that are just going to flat die. I've had him for a long time, since he was a kitten, really. He looked up and Clay saw the man was on the verge of tears. Also, I guess I see him as my luck, my mojo. He saved my life, remember? Now we're your, mo now we're your mojo, Clay said. He didn't want to point out that he, he himself had almost certainly saved Tom's life once already. And it was true. Right, Alice? Yep, she said. Tom had found a poncho for her, and she wore a knapsack on her back. Although there currently was nothing in it but batteries for the flashlight. And Clay was quite sure that creepy little sneaker, which was at least no longer tied to her wrist. Clay was also carrying batteries in his pack, along with a Coleman lantern. They had nothing else in Alice's suggestion. She said there was no reason for them to carry what they could pick up along the way. With the three musketeers, Tom. All for one and one for all. Now let's go over to Nickelby's house and see if we can get some muskets. Nickerson? He was still stroking the cat. She was smart enough and compassionate enough. Maybe that too. Not to say something like whatever. But Clay could see she was getting low in patience department. He said, Tom? Time to go. Yeah, I suppose. He started to put the cat inside, then picked it up and kissed it firmly between the ears. Rave bore it with no more than the slight narrowing of the eyes. Tom put it down the sofa and stood. Stood. Double rations in the kitchen by the stove, kiddo, he said, plus a big bowl of milk with the rest of half and half poured in for good measures. Back doors open. Try to remember where home is. And maybe, hey, Maybe I'll see you. The cat, the cat jumped down and walked out of the room towards the kitchen with its tail up. And true to its kind, it never looked back. Clay's portfolio bent and with a horizontal wrinkle running both ways from the knife slash in the middle, leaned against the living room wall. He glanced at it on the way by and resisted an urge to touch it. He thought briefly of the people inside he lived but so long both in this little studio and the much wider, or so he liked to flatter himself. 
Reach to his imagination. Wizard Flack, Sleepy Jean, Jumping Jack Flash, Poison Sally, and the Dark Wanderer, of course. Two days ago, he thought that maybe they were going to, to be stars. Now they had a whole running through them. And Tom McCourt, Cat for Company. He tells Sleepy Jean leaving town on Robbie and Robo Gaish, saying, So long, boys. Me, 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 me. I'll be back with this wave again. So long, boys, he said out loud, a little self conscious, but not very. It was, it was the end of the world after all. As farewells went, it wasn't much, but it wouldn't have to do. And a sleepy Jean would have also said, It sure beats a poke in the eye with a rusty brandon, brandoning. Branding Arn. Clee followed Alice and Tom out onto the porch, into the sound of soft autumn rain. Tom and his tribble were with the hood on Alice's poncho, and Tom had found Clee a red socks cap that would keep his head dry for a while at least. If the light rain didn't get heavier, and if it did, well, forage shouldn't be a problem, as Alice had pointed out. That would surely include foul weather gear. From the slight elevation of the porch, they could see roughly two blocks of Salem Street. It was impossible to be sure in the falling light, but it appeared completely deserted except for a few bodies and the food litter the crazies had left behind. Each of them was wearing a knife seated in Skybark. Clay had made, if Tom was right about the Nickersons, they would soon be able to do better. Clay hoped so. He might be able to use the butcher knife from Soul Kitchen again, but he still wasn't sure he would be able to use it in cold blood. Alice held a flashlight in her left hand. She looked to make sure Tom had one too, and nodded. Okay, she said. You take us to the Nickerson house, right? Right, Tom said. And if we see someone on our way there, we stop right away and put the lights on them. She looked at Tom, then Clay, with some anxiety. They had been over this before. Clay guessed she probably obsessed the same way before big tests, and of course, this was a very big one. Right, Tom said. We, we see our names are Tom, Clay, and Alice. We're normal. What are your names? Clay said, if they have flashlight like us, we can almost assume. We can assume anything. She said, restlessly. Curiously, my father says, assume makes an ass out of you and me. Get it, you and... I get it, Clay said. Alice brushed it at her eyes. Although whether to wipe away rain or tears, Clay wasn't sure. He wondered briefly and painfully if Johnny was somewhere caring for him, crying for him. Right now, Clay hoped he was. He hoped his son was still capable of tears, of memory. If they can answer, if they can say their names, they're fine and they're probably safe. Alice said, right? Right, Clay said. Yeah, Tom agreed, a little absent absently. He was looking at a street where the, there were no people and no bobbing flashlight beams, near or far. Someplace in the distance, gunshots popped. They sounded like fireworks, the air stank of burning and, and char. I had all day. Clay thought they were smelling it more strongly now because it was wet. They wondered, he wondered how long before the smell of decaying flesh turned the fog hanging over Greater Boston into a reek. It's supposed to depend on how warm the days ahead turn out to be. If we meet normal people and they ask us what we're doing or where we're going, remember the story, she said. We're looking for survivors, Tom said. That's right, because they're our friends and neighbors. Any people we, we meet will just, will just be passing through. They want to keep moving. Later on, we'll probably want to look to hook up with other normal people because there's safety in numbers. But right now, Right now, we'd like to get to those guns, Clay said. If there are any guns to get. Come on, Alice, let's do this. She looked worriedly at him. What's wrong? When, what am I missing? You can tell me. I know I'm just a kid. Patiently. As patiently as he could, with nerves that felt like overtuned guitar strings. Clay said, There's nothing wrong with it, honey. I just want to get rolling. I don't think we're going to see anyone. Anyway, I think it's too soon. I hope you're right, she said. 
My my hair is a mess, and I've chipped a nail. She looked at her. They looked at her silently for a moment, then laughed. After that was the better. It was better among them, and stayed better until the end. No, Alice said. She made a gagging sound. No, no, I can't. A loud gagging sound. Then I'm going to throw up. I'm sorry. She plunged out of the Coleman's glare and into the gloom of Nickerson's living room, which adjoined the kitchen with a white arch. Clay heard a soft thump as she went to her knees on the carpet, then more gagging, a pause, and gasp, and then she was vomiting. She was almost relieved. Oh Christ, Tom said. He pulled in a long, gasping breath, and this time spoke in a wavering exhalation that was nearly a howl. Oh Christ! Tom, Clay said. He saw how the little man was swaying on his feet and understood he was on the verge of fainting. Why not? These bloody leavings had been his neighbors. Tom, he stepped between Tom and the two bodies on the kitchen floor, between Tom and the most of the splattering blood, which looked as black as India ink in the Coleman's unforgiving white glare. He tapped the side of Tom's face with his free hand. Don't pass out. And when he saw Tom steady on his feet, he dropped his voice a little. Go on in the other room and take care of Alice. I'll take care of the, the kitchen. Why won't you want to go in there? Tom asked. That's Beth Niggerson with her brains, her brains all over. He swallowed. There was an audible click in his throat. Most of her face is gone, but I recognize the blue jumper with the white snowflakes on it. And that's Heidi on the floor by the center island, their daughter. I recognize her even with... He shook his head as if to clear it, then repeat, why would you want to? I'm pretty sure I see what we came for, Please said. He was astounded by how calm he sounded. In the kitchen? Tom tried to look past him, and Clay moved to block, moved to block his view. Trust me, you see to Alice, if she can. You two start looking around for more guns. Shout if you hit pay dirt. And be careful. Mr. Nixon may be here, too. I mean, we could assume he was at work when all this went down, but as Alice did, Dad says, assume makes an ass out of you and me, Tom said. He managed to sink, sickly smile. Gotcha. He started to turn away, then turn back. I don't care where we go, Clay, but I don't want to stay here any longer than we have to. I didn't exactly love Arnie and Beth Nickerson, but they were my neighbors, and they treat me a hell of a lot better than that idiot Scatoni from around the block understood. Tom snapped on his flashlight and went in, into the Nickerson's living room. Clay heard him mumbling to Alice, comfort, comforting her, sealing himself. Clay walked into the kitchen with the Coleman's lan lantern half held up, stepping around the puddles of blood on the hardwood floor. It dried now, but he still didn't want to put his shoes in any more of it than he had to. The girl lying on her back by the center island had been tall, but both her pigtails and the angular lines of her body suggested a child two or three years younger than Alice. Her head was cocked at a strenuous angle, almost a parody of interrogation, and her dead eyes bulged. Her hair, her hair had been boomstraw blonde, but all of it on the left side of her head, the side that had taken the blow with that killer, was now the same dark maroon as the stains on the floor. Her mother reclined below the counter to the right of the stove, where the handsome cherry wood cabinets came together to form a corner. Her hands were ghost white with flour, and her bloody bitten legs were indecorously splayed. Once before starting work on a limited run comic called Battle Hell, Clee had accessed, accessed a selection of fatal gunshot photos on the web, thinking there might be something he could use. There was not. Gunshot wounds spoke a terrible blank language of their own, of their own and here it was again. Beth Nixon was mostly spray and gristle from her left eye on up. Her right eye was drifted into the upper orbit of its socket and she had died trying to look into her own head. 
her back hair and a good deal of her brain matter was caked on the cherry wood cabinet against which she had leaned in her brief moment of dying. A few flies were buzzing around her. Clay began to gag. He turned his head and covered his mouth. He told himself he had to control himself. In the other room, Alice had stopped vomiting. In fact, he could hear her and Tom talking together as they moved deeper into the house. And he didn't want to get her going again. Think of them as dummies, props in a movie, he told himself. But he knew he could never do that. When he looked back, he looked at the other things on the floor instead. That helped. The gun he had already seen, the kitchen was spacious, and the gun was all the way on the other side, lying between the fridge and one of the cabinets with a barrel sticking out. His first impulse on seeing the dead woman and the dead girl had been to avert his eyes. They happened on the gun barrel purely by accident. But maybe I would have known there had be a gun. Had to be a gun. He even saw where it had been, a wall-mounted clip between the built-in TV and the industrial-sized can opener. There were gadget nuts as well as gun nuts, Tom had said. A wall-mounted pistol in the kitchen? Just way to leap into your hand. Why, if that wasn't the best of both worlds, what was? Clay? That was Alice, coming from some distance. What? There followed the sound of feet quickly ascending a set of stairs. Then Alice called from the living room. Tom said you want to know if he had petered. We just did. There must be a dozen guns downstairs in the den. Rifles and pistols both. They're in the cabinet with an alarm company sticker on it. So we'll probably get arrested. That's a joke. Are you coming? In a minute. Hon. Don't come out here. Don't worry. Don't you stay there and get grossed out. He was... Beyond grossed out, far beyond. There were two other objects lying on the bloody hardwood floor of the Nickerson kitchen. One was a rolling pin, which made sense. It was a, a pie tin, a mixing bowl, and a cheery yellow canister marked flower sitting on the center island. The other object on the floor, this one lying, this one lying not too distant from one of Heidi Nickerson's hands was a cell phone only a teenager could love. Blue with big orange daisy, the calls splashed all over it. Clay could see what had happened, little as he wanted to. That Nickerson is making a pie. Does she knew that she know something awful has started to happen in greater Boston, in America, maybe in the world? Is it on TV? If so, the TV didn't send her a crazy gram. Clay was sure of that. Her daughter got one, though. Oh yes, and Heidi attacked her mother. Did Bad Nickerson try to reason with her daughter before driving her to the floor with a blow from the rolling pin? Or did she just strike? Not in hate, but in pain and fear. In any case, it wasn't enough, and Bat wasn't wearing pants. She was wearing a jumper, and her legs were bare. Clay pulled down the dead woman's skirt. He did it gently, covering the plain working at home underwear that she had sold at the end. Heidi surely knew older than 14, and perhaps only 12. Must have been growling in that savage nonsense language they seemed to learn all at once after they got the full dose of saying be gone from their phone, photo, phones, seeing things like Rast and Ela and Kazala, Ken. The first blow from the rolling pin had knocked her down, but not out, and the mad girl had begun to work on her mother's legs. Not little nips either, but deep searing bites. Some that had been driven all the way to the bone. Clay could see not only tooth marks, but ghostly tattoos that must have been left by youth, by young Heidi's braces. And so, probably screaming, undoubtedly in agony, almost certainly not aware of what she, she was doing. Beth Nickerson had struck again, this time much harder. Clay could almost hear the muffled crack as the girl's neck broke. Beloved daughter, dead on the floor of the state-of-the-art kitchen, with braces on her teeth and her state-of-the-art cell phone by one outstretched hand. And had her mother stopped to consider before popping the gun from its clip between the TV and the can opener, where it had been waiting who knew how long for a burglar or a rapist to appear in this clean, well-lit kitchen. Clay thought not. Clay thought, 
it would have been no pause that she would have wanted to catch up with her daughter's fleeing soul while the explanation for what she had done was still fresh on her lips. Clay went to their gun and picked it up. From the gadget boy, like Arnie Nickerson, he would have accepted, expected an automatic, maybe even one with laser sight, but this was a plain old Colt 45 revolver. He supposed it made sense. His wife might feel more comfortable with this kind of weapon gun. No nonsense about making sure it was loaded if the gun was needed or wasting time fishing a clip out from behind the spatulas or spices if it wasn't. Then rocking the slide to make sure there was a hot one in the chamber. No with this old whore who just had to swung the barrel out. Which Clay then did with ease. he drawn a thousand variations of this very gun for Dark Wanderer. As he expected, only one of the six chambers was empty. He shook out one of the other loads, knowing just what he would find. Bet Nickerson 45 was loaded with highly illegal cop killer bullets, fraggers. No wonder the top of her head was gone. The wonder was that she had any left at all. He looked down at the remains of the woman's leaning in the corner and began to cry. Clay? That was Tom, coming up from the stairs from the basement. Man, Arnie had everything. There's an automatic weapon that would have gotten him a stretch in Walpole, I bet. Clay? Are you alright? I'm coming, Clay said, wiping his eyes. He safe tied the revolver and stuck it in his belt. Then he took off the knife and laid on Bat Nickerson's counter, still in its homemade scabbard. It seemed they were trading up. Give me two more minutes. Yo. Play her thumb plumping back to Arnie's Nickerson downstairs, armory and smiled in spite of the tears still running down his face. He was something he would have found he would have to remember. Give a little a nice little gay guy from Malden, a room full of guns to play with. The stars, they say, yo, just like Syl Sylvester Stallone. Clay started going through the drawers. In the third one he tried, he found a heavy red box marked American Defender, 45 caliber American Defender, 50 rounds. It was under the dish towels. Put the box in his pocket and went to join Tom and Alice. He wanted to get out of here now as quickly as possible. The trick would be to getting them to go without trying to take Arnie's Nickerson entire gun collection along. Halfway through the arch, he paused and glanced back, holding the Coleman's lantern high, looking at the bodies. Pulling down the skirt of a woman's jumper hadn't held much. They were still just corpses, their wounds as naked as Noah when his son had come upon him in liquor. He could find something to cover them with. But once he started covering bodies, where would it end? Where? With Sharon? With his son? God forbid, he whispered, but he doubted that God would simply... Because he asked, he lowered the lantern and followed the, the dancing glow of flashlights downstairs to Tom and Alice. They both wore belts with large caliber handguns in the holsters, and these were automatics. Tom had also slung an ammunition bandolier over his shoulder. Clay didn't know where to laugh or start crying again. Part of him felt like doing both at the same time. Of course, if he did that, they would think he was having he was having hysterics. And of course, they would be right. The plasma TV mounted on the wall down here was a very, very big brother of the one in the kitchen. Another TV, only slightly smaller, and a multi-brand video game hookup Clay would at once upon a time have loved to examine. The fawn over maybe. As if to balance it off, a vintage Seaburg jukebox stood in the corner next to the Nickerson ping pong table. All its fabulous colors dark and dead. And of course there was the gun cabinet. Two of them still locked, but with their glass fronts broken. There were locking bars, but he had a toolbox in his garage, Tom said. Alice used a wrench to break them off. There were cookies, Alice said modestly. This was in the garage behind the toolbox wrapped in a piece of blanket. It is, 
it's what I think it is. She picked it up from the ping pong table, holding it carefully by the wire stock and carried it over to Clay. Holy shit, he said. This is... He squinted at the embossing above the trigger guard. I think it's Russian. I'm sure it is, Tom said. Do you think it's Kalashnikov? You got me. All the... Are there bullets that match it? In boxes that match the printing on the brown? I mean, half a dozen. Heavy boxes. It's a machine gun, isn't it? You might as well call it out. Call it that, I guess. Clay flicked a lever. A lever. I'm pretty sure one of the, these positions is single shot and the other is out of fire. How many rounds did it fire in a minute? Alice asked. I don't know, Clay said, but I think it's round per second. Whoa, her eyes got round. Can you figure out how to shoot it? Alice, I'm pretty sure they teach 16 year old farm boys how to shoot these. Yes, I can figure it out. It might take a box of ammo, but I can figure it out. Please, God, don't let it blow up in, in my hands. He thought, is something like that legal in Massachusetts? She asked. It is now, Alice, Tom said, not smiling. Is it time to go? Yes, she said, and then perhaps still not entirely comfortable being the one to make decisions she looked at clay yes he said north fine with me alice said yeah tom said north let's do it and that will be the end of um the chapter molden um yeah i'm uh, glad i finished another chapter uh the next chapter will be called gaten academy and uh probably this weekend i will come back uh with this book reading and uh, yeah, I'm glad I actually picked it back up and uh, yeah, I continue with it. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, catch you in the next one. Bye bye.